Come and see with me. I really don't want to take my shirt off. Okay, I'll keep it on. We're drying the sun. I knew that when I saw Nick's biceps out, the body image was gonna come into this. Heartstopper is back and I love it. You know I love it. I've done reaction videos to seasons one and two and I was so excited to delve in to season three. And I know based on where the last season left off that this one is gonna delve into Charlie's likely diagnosis of an eating disorder. This show not only tells the uh, very relatable story for many of us in the LGBTQ community about coming out and maybe how far things have come over the last few decades compared to when I was a teenager compared to when I am now as a 35 year old man watching this but we're now going to start delving into the unique way that mental health affects the queer community as well. If you're new to my channel then hi my name is Dr Elia I am a psychiatrist in the UK and I make content about mental health and mental illness I do lots of reaction videos if you like that sort of thing do check out the other videos do consider subscribing otherwise we're going to do a reaction video to episode one from season three of Heartstopper. So ready? Let's crack up. Nick, I have something to tell you. I love you. I'm in love with you and I just wanted you to know. And you don't have to say it back yet. I mean, but I hope you do. Because I'm properly in love with you. And I want you to feel the same way too eventually. So cute. When I was growing up, gay couples on TV were complete stereotypes. Femme gays and camp gays were the butt of the joke. There were no rom-coms with gay couples. There was no Ross and Rachel, will they, won't they? And I think that's why so many adults, particularly gay millennials, are so invested in this show. Proud that it exists, but at the same time wishing it existed when we were this age. I know I needed a show like this when I was 15 or 16, and I didn't have it. Hi. Gun show. What? I've never seen you in a vest before. Well, I've never seen you in a cap before. <laughs> Season two started to hint that underneath Charlie's anxiety and low self-esteem was disordered eating where we know body image is central. So is it intentional that while Charlie struggles with that, Nick walks in looking absolutely jacked? My mum almost walked in on us again, so you owe me. Living with me is like a dream. Heads up! The representation on this show around sexual orientation, gender identity, intersectionality, it's so wonderful, but also the storylines highlight the very real minority stress that still exists and the discrimination that can still break up families. Queer people can then be very reliant on chosen families, often instead of biological ones, not in addition to. I love you. Oh. Well, thank you. Um, I think it's too early for me to say that. Sorry. Charlie's catastrophizing, thinking that the worst possible scenario is inevitable and that that outcome is because of the choices that he makes. You hold yourself responsible for that worst case scenario inevitably coming to fruition. I want the most romantic summer ever with you before you go to Lambert. Well, I support that idea. The sparks and the butterflies are so cute. Yes, it's cheesy, but it's also really cute. And there are so many straight rom-coms out there about childhood sweethearts. And I think this show tries to level the playing field and show that queer people can have that too. Chris? I'm all right, thanks. You okay? You seem kind of stressed out. A little bit. I want to tell Nick that I love him. <laughs> Charlie, you're already dating him. Yeah, I know, but I want to say the words I love you. 
Let's recap from last season about Charlie's eating. Charlie's been making excuses to avoid eating and his anxieties over food were becoming much, much more evident to Nick, which burst this bubble of everything's perfect, right? But Nick wasn't avoiding that food issue. And that would be very easy to do because it's an incredibly hard topic to broach. What we weren't privy to is why he's been restricting, except that Charlie, at least on a conscious level, was perceiving it to be about control, exerting control in situations that otherwise he doesn't have control in. And I anticipate that this season is going to delve into that more, but it's going to be such a point of vulnerability for him that I hope he doesn't push everybody away. You know I get stressed out of this stuff. Oh yes, I am very aware. Well, why don't you just sit here staring at him all day instead then? I'm not, I'm not staring. <laughs> Haven't you already seen him shirtless in the changing rooms? Yeah, this is an entirely different context. Right. In the words of Jonah from Superstore, too much empathy? I don't think he actually does. I mean, some of us are, are thinkers and we use thinking about stuff and intellectualizing stuff as a way of avoiding our feelings. I couldn't possibly know what that feels like. Might be me a little bit. <laughs> little bit. Others wear their heart on their sleeve and their emotions are really evident to the people around them. But emotions don't usually just stay with you. They bounce between people. They affect relationships where the emotional states of both parties or all parties involved affect one another. And because you know your emotions are so on display and affecting somebody else, that can make people feel guilty about being an emotional burden on other people. That gives us a bit of a glimmer into Charlie's stress and anxiety. And while stress doesn't cause an eating disorder, stress does affect an eating disorder and eating disorders are rarely seen purely in isolation. I don't really get the appeal. What, with anyone? No, not really. You've never seen someone really attractive and just felt like... butterflies. No. I think I'm immune. Charlie's kind of acknowledging that maybe he's got a bit of a blind spot here. Can't really relate to Isaac. But I suppose he's trying to take steps to understand him, which is better than the alternative, which is thinking that you know it and thinking that you get it when actually you don't. I mean, don't get me wrong, from Isaac's point of view, having to explain yourself and how you feel and part of your identity and existence over and over again is knackering. So hopefully then Charlie does his own research into asexuality rather than just Isaac having to give every single one of his friends a tutorial on what asexuality is. Do you think that's like... Do you think you're asexual then? Probably. Uh, probably aromantic too. I don't really know what that is. That's all right, you can Google it later. Good line, do your research. Asexuality and aromanticism are still really over medicalized. There are a lot of healthcare professionals out there that can be quick to attribute it to trauma or say, well, are you really, or are you just gay and you haven't figured it out yet? Or some people try and attribute it purely to a biological mechanism, low testosterone, race prolactin. In reality, we don't know why some people are asexual and aromantic and some people aren't. Just in the same way, we don't know exactly why some people are born gay or born bi or born trans. There are probably biological, psychological, and social factors. History though teaches us that research into the neuroscience of homosexuality has used this question of why as a slippery slope towards changing what they see as a pathological defect. Research into the why has quickly led into questions around the validity of conversion therapy. You could tell the others Isaac, they'd be supportive. No, I know they would be. Honestly, I, I just can't be bothered to give everyone a vocab lesson. Fair play, it's knackering. I love you. Oh, I love you too. And if you can say that to me, you can definitely say it to Nick. That is totally different, you know. <laughs> Advocacy, even for yourself, is exhausting. I don't pretend to know what it's like to be asexual or aromantic. I can speak from my experience as a gay man. You know, especially when you're training as a doctor, you move teams like every six months. That's uh, a new group of colleagues that you have to work with, a new group of people where at least one person will make the default assumption that you're straight. Then you have to come out again and you have the uncertainty of how people are going to react. Is that going to make your professional life a lot more difficult? Coming out and explaining yourself to other people is not a one-off event. It's exhausting. <laughs> It's this sort of tunnel vision. <laughs> it's dark cloud that looms in as soon as you grab the chip. He's not just avoiding eating, but you can see there is a fixation on the food and a fear of it as we delve into the emotional states that drive that behavior. It's okay if it's a lot. I just love her so much and 
She is so much safer living with me. So it has to be like this for now. When someone you love's in trouble, you do anything to help them. Rescuing each other. There are differences between Nick and Charlie, but actually in some core values and core beliefs, they're very similar. They want to protect each other, not necessarily seeing each other as fragile. A lot of their emotional containment comes through the emotional containment of the other. Nick wants to protect Charlie. Charlie's had moments in the last season of wanting to protect Nick. But what strikes me about Charlie is he often wants to protect Nick from him, that he's a burden. I guess I've just been distracted by... Other things. Anorexia nervosa is actually one of the less common eating disorders, even if it's one of the most well known. It's less common in society than binge eating disorder and bulimia. But in my clinical experience, it is the eating disorder that can cause some of the gravest and most serious complications, particularly the physical health consequences of malnutrition. Anorexia is characterized by people restricting the amount that they eat, often creating rules around what they eat, when they eat, and chasing a weight target that just keeps dropping lower and lower that you never fully achieve. It's an ever moving target that's driven by distorted body image, seeing yourself as much more overweight than you actually are. The diagnosis is no longer dependent on weight or BMI, nor should it have ever been dependent on that. There's something I need to talk to Charlie about. There's something serious. It's hard to know how to talk to him about it without making things worse. You're doing your best. That's all you can do. Yeah, so he... Can we go in the sea again, please? And how do you broach this conversation? It's so difficult as a family member. I've only ever been in this position as a doctor, not as someone that's had a loved one with an eating disorder. And as a doctor, it's different. My job is to try and make the right diagnosis, understand the person that's in front of me, and try and engage them in the right treatment. The success of my job is not measured in whether people like me or not, though obviously it's, it, it's nicer and it's better if they do. But sometimes the right advocacy that I need to do as a doctor involves challenging people, disagreeing with people, broaching topics that people don't want to broach, telling people things that they don't want to hear. And then my job is to cop that and to be the one that cops that to shield the family from copying that because actually their closeness and the trust between family members and the patient is so core to the success of long-term treatment. Come and see with me. I really don't want to take my shirt off. OK, I'll keep it on. We're drying the sun. I knew that when I saw Nick's biceps out, the body image was gonna come into this. Body dysmorphia is a risk factor for a range of mental illnesses. People with anorexia will see themselves as overweight, despite all evidence to the contrary. That core belief is one of the factors that drives the anxiety and drives the restrictive behaviors. Trying to chase and achieve a weight target that just keeps dropping lower and lower and lower, because the core belief never shifts. All the restrictive behaviors seek to do is confirm the core belief. I think you have an eating disorder. Don't run, Charlie, don't run. I've been doing some research and um, I know you don't want me to try and fix you or anything. I just care about It's you like the walls are closing in on you. Much worse. It's been getting recently. I'm just trying I don't think I do. The anxiety and the fear that the person he loves has seen the vulnerability, that maybe he's let the mask slip, that he's seen the person underneath the defences that maybe he sees as flawed. Nick has seen the thing that Charlie has been so desperate to hide from and run from and maintain some degree of denial. That person that's seen you is also the person that you fear losing more than anything else in the world. Don't run, Charlie, don't run, don't run. I, I know that I've got some issues. I, I don't think they're that bad. Minimising a little bit. Common defence. Sure. Yeah, I'm fine. You don't need to worry about me. Family members and loved ones that broach this topic in such a caring and empathetic way, you are gold. Because you risk bearing the brunt and being pushed away. The right thing to do at this point is leave the conversation, let it simmer, and just keep being with the person, telling them that you care. Because hopefully then Charlie will realise, well, if other people have seen it as a problem, maybe it is a problem, but they've not left me. They've seen this part of me, and yet they're still here. And that challenge is this different core belief that he's got, that if people know the real me, they'll leave. Moving people towards insight in 
into the severity and significance of these problems, it's a journey, it's not quick. Are you angry at me? They're both anxious and scared. No. No. Is that what you wanted to talk about as well? Yeah. They're both anxious and scared that the other will push them away. They have much more things in common than the things that they don't. I was actually going to say that... I love you. What? Turn off the shower and say it back. Come on. Charlie is so brave. They both are. Nick felt the fear of bringing up the eating issue with Charlie. Did it anyway. Charlie's felt the fear of saying I love you, knowing that Nick may or may not say it back. And he said it anyway. This is an excellent episode about how to feel fear, but not let it dictate your life. You're still damp. Yeah, well, you're the one who said I love you for the first time when I was in the shower. Oh, why did I do that? <laughs> why are we like this? Because you're Charlie. And you love me. I love you. I think today is the best day of my life. Thank God he said it back. I need the containment of knowing the relationship is secure as we delve into this issue of anorexia. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. And as the season goes on and we watch more episodes, I'd really like to know if any of you have got your own lived experience with conditions like OCD, anorexia, body dysmorphia. Do you think this representation is accurate? Which bits do you think they get right? Which bits do you think they get wrong? If you're comfortable, let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already, why don't you go back all the way to the start of season one and watch my first reaction videos to Heartstopper. Otherwise, I'll keep going on season three very, very soon. Love you, bye.